Good afternoon and welcome to our first First Friday webinar. This is a series of webinars sponsored by the Women's Resource Center and led by the founder of the Women's Money Empowerment, Dr. Laura Mattia. My name is Lori Gentile, Director of Client Services for the Women's Resource Center, and I'll be your host today. As you will notice, all lines are muted, but we still want to hear from you. Please click on the QA box at the bottom and type in your question. At the end of the webinar, Laura will answer as many as time allows. I also wanted to let you know that the, women's, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website starting next week. Before we start, I wanted to take just a moment to tell you about the Women's Resource Center. We're a nonprofit organization focused on empowering women in Manatee and Sarasota counties since 1979. We provide mental health counseling, career planning, educational scholarships and programs, and legal and financial consultation and education, all at low cost or no cost to our clients. We serve approximately 2,000 women each year with attendance of over 8,000. Thank you so much for attending today's session, Money Empowerment During Cer Uncertain Times. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Mattia. Childhood and growing up around money that left, uh, left problems. I actually lived out of my car for a period of time and struggled quite a bit. And when I got married to my first husband, he had difficulty keeping a job and I had two small children at home. And finally, after all the angst and all the problems and difficulties that I had, um, I took a step back and I said, you know, my parents had always said money was evil, money was bad, you shouldn't focus on money. I said, you know, money is not evil, money is not bad. You need to understand it so you can use it in your life. And I went out, that was the first uh, time I went and got an MBA in finance and accounting and went on from there to study finance and become a, an expert in the area of finance. And through that experience, I learned how important it was and how it helps me to actually develop a, a, a plan to protect myself from financial disaster. It enabled me to make choices in my life on my terms, allowed me to, to pick how I wanted my life to be. It helped me develop uh, uh, skills that enabled me to contribute to the community and even the workplace. And you know, now I still, I do a lot of financial work for a couple of different not-for-profits and I really enjoy that. So I'm able to make a difference and I'm really able to make a difference in the world with these financial skills. And so I wanna encourage women uh, uh, all over to get involved and get engaged in their financial situation because it can really be life-changing. And the reason why I, why I call it catching the fifth wave, well, I really believe that the more women engage in financial decisions, the more they can participate in all the big decisions that we make in our lives, our families, and in the world, and that it really is a tool for us to become more like equals. And where the women's movement has had four waves, um, I'm suggesting that this should be the fifth wave, where we become financially engaged and are no longer dependent on others. So um, it, this has been an uh, overall philosophy of mine. I've been out there for the past 20 years or so being a woman, uh, women's advocate in the world of finance, doing research on women and money. And I'm so happy to be part of the Women's Resource Center where we're able to offer these additional uh, tools and, and different things for other women to become more financially financially engaged. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the focus of this conversation because this is, I think, a little bit where we start. I want to start with the statistics around women and money. I then want to talk about the big elephant in the room, if you will, um, our current transition that we're going through today and how that may impact our financial choices and our financial decisions. I want to talk about what matters and where you want to put your focus right now. 
what you want to avoid, and what should we do. So, you know, we as women have made tremendous strides in so many areas of life. There's been tremendous progress, yet we still lag men when it comes to financial security and retirement preparedness. And some of that is of no fault of our own. We make less money when we do work. We take off time often to take care of other people. And so that also reduces our overall earnings. We receive less social security than men. We have a lot of different things that we really can't control. But there are some things that we can control. One of the things that we find, and this is the research, this is, I know not everybody is this way, but when we look at large data sets of women, we see that women are less interested in the money. They think perhaps money is evil or not interesting or compelling. They are also less willing to take risk. And so we find that 48% of women versus 41% of men are worried about taking too much risk. And that 58% of women are concerned about making poor decisions. And perhaps that's wise because women are less financially literate than men. Again, not all women, but most women. And one study that uh, I did uh, uh, with a couple of other individuals, studied women across different age cohorts. And what we found was that women in every single cohort, in every single age group, were less literate than men. This data set included women from both the US and the UK, and is a very similar dynamic in both countries. Uh, I wanted to understand even further which women. So I broke it down into women that were married versus not married, women that had children versus not having children, uh, and wanted to understand which women were more financially illiterate. And so in, a, in an exam, in a test from where the top score was 100, you can see that no women at least scored enough that I would give them a C as a teacher, um, they all failed. But that women that were higher earners and made their own income tended to be more financially literate, regardless of whether they had children or not. We, even low earner women, if they were married, also tended to be more literate. But women who were never married were less literate. And the real group of women that I've always been concerned about and have done a lot of research work on and studying and trying to assist are those women who are not married, um, but they once were. So they're either divorced or widowed. And those are the women that tend to be the least literate and have the most problems in the financial arena. Um, we know that when we talk about knowledge around finances, uh, that women when they rate themselves, will tend to rate themselves uh, higher in certain things than others. And so what I have listed here on the left-hand side of the slide are a variety of activities in, in finance. And then if we just looked at the blue and the dark gray, we would say that, okay, people, women score themselves on this particular parameter either an A or B in terms of their financial knowledge. And so managing debt, managing overall money, uh, getting a mortgage, getting insurance protection, those types of things, women uh, score, score themselves fairly high. But if you look at the very bottom, when we start talking about investing, when we talk about creating an income stream in retirement or saving for children's education or even saving for retirement, they don't feel as strong and as knowledgeable. And so those we know are areas that we wanna focus on. And this is important because we know that the average age that a woman becomes a widow is 56 years old. Nine out of 10 women will eventually be on their own at some point, which means that we need to have these financial skills. We need to develop these financial skills, even if we're married or we have somebody else we can lean on, that person may not always be available to us in the future. And 
part of this is because we live longer than men. It's just a, a, a mere fact. We live longer, we earn less, we save less for retirement. All of this spells problem. And so when we look at the poverty rates, and this comes from um, the Social Security Administration, um, there's been a lot of reports that have come out of the government that have uh, identified which women are in poverty or right above the poverty levels. We see that married women are fine. They are equally um, less likely to be in poverty as men. But the places where we see that women struggle are when they're widowed, divorced, or never been married. So we think about these life transitions, and I've done a lot of work around life transitions. I actually am part of an organization called the Financial Transition Institute, where we've been studying these transitions that or everyone goes through. Um, I've been focused really on women and their transitions into widowhood and divorce. And we define transition as an event which actually changes our assumptions about life, it changes our assumptions about ourselves, and actually compels us and requires us to change our behavior, change our outlook, change how we deal with other people. And this type of thing can be um, positive or negative. Sometimes we initiate the change, right? So we, we decide that we want to get a divorce. We decide that we want to leave a job. We initiate the change. But nevertheless, these transitions can be difficult, whether we've chosen them or not. And a lot of it has to do with our perception of how we view this overall change. Uh, there are four stages to transition. And a lot of people, I hear this all the time on the news and in other places, that we are currently dealing with the new normal. There is no question that we are in the middle of a transition. And we are not in a transition by ourselves. When we go through a divorce or widowhood, those transitions tend to be more about ourselves and our immediate families. But we're actually going through a transition, a collective transition, not just with our family, friends, neighborhood, and state or country, but with everyone in the world, we are all experiencing this transition together, which really makes this monumental. And we are currently not in this normal, new normal. We are in the ending stage. Now, the Financial Transitions Institute has done some additional work on this. I first wanted to mention um, that there's this one uh, gentleman that's done work on financial transitions or transitions in general. And I wanted you to take a notice um, on why I'm saying that this is just the ending stage. This is not the new normal. We're somewhere here on the left-hand side of this curve where we're feeling anxiety. We're feeling fear. We're feeling threat. We are not in a place where we're gradually accepting how things are going to look. We don't even know how they're going to look. We don't even know if it can work in our own lives. So that's why we know we're not in the new normal. So the Financial Transition Institute specifically identified this ending stage, this pandemic ending stage, as a place where we're actually going through some grieving. We're going through some loss. We're waiting for... Uh, some answers in terms of testing and treatment and vaccines. And we're very, very cautious and um, uncertain about how things are going to look. This stage could last a pretty long time. It could be up to another year until we actually start going through the passage stage of redefining what the world looks like and how our lives look within that world. And it's only when we start really redefining and feeling comfort in this new space that we start entering into that new normal. So um, I recently did a presentation for a group of women who uh, wanted me to talk to them about some of these things. And we asked them to define uh, how they felt about their current situation in this current pandemic. And we asked them a few other questions about what was concerning them. And it was very interesting how their concerns had changed from just two months ago. But what we found was that 
the majority of women, uh, two thirds of women felt that they were fairly often uh, feeling some elements of this idea of being overwhelmed, of feeling numb, like they weren't certain where to go next. Uh, none of them felt that they never felt this way currently. And fortunately, none of them felt like they always felt this way. But it's important to understand that we are all probably feeling some of these emotions at certain parts of the day, whether uh, you know it's just that we're focusing on it or not focusing on it. Some of us are able to keep fairly busy at work and we're not allowing these emotions to get at us, but they're still in the back of our mind. And the reason why it's important to understand that is that it actually impacts our decision-making. So this is not meant to be a biology lesson, but I just wanted to get everybody on the same page in terms of how we deal with stress. And this is something that I talk to the widows and the, the women going through a divorce and various transition. It's the same thing, that when we are going up, we are feeling stressed, we automatically start going to other parts of our brain to make decisions. So the neocortex, which is the primary part of our brain that we use for anal analysis and reasoning and logic, shuts down. And we wind up using more of our limbic system, which is where our emotions are, and the reptilian complex, which is our instincts, is the fight or flight. And so just being aware that we're not always thinking so clearly or rational is an important thing to think about at this particular time of what we're going through. So these four stages um, you know, start with this idea, if you think of that last slide I showed you, of anticipation. Now, in certain instances, when I'm working with an individual, for example, um, I might be working with a woman who's husband is critically ill and he's not actually dying, but there's time to prepare for what's going to happen next. We didn't have much time for this anticipation stage. We moved right into the stage of ending. And again, in this stage, it's where we feel uh, a sense of overwhelm and, and, and a certain amount of numb, not sure where to go next. And so what we want to focus when we're in this stage is we want to focus on the idea of doing financial triage. What is the most important? We know that we are vulnerable. We want to make sure that we don't make any irrevocable decisions. And so being very careful in terms of the types of things that we're focusing on is really important. If we were in a workshop right now, what I would do is I would have all of you take out a piece of paper and I would ask you to divide the piece of paper up into three sections. And so we would take the paper and we'd say, okay, now what do we need to focus on right now? And you might put on your paper things like, well, I need to pay the bills. Or if I can't pay the bills, I need to talk to the person that I owe the money to, to make sure they understand that my intention is to pay the bills. We want to make sure that we fully communicate our intentions so that nobody misunderstands what we're going to do. Maybe you had a trip scheduled that you need to cancel. Maybe you want to make sure that you have the key essential items that you need for daily living. And you want to establish emergency funds. And for those of us that are in a position where we do have some income coming in, if you don't have an emergency fund established, um, which you should have had, then that's okay. We want to start planning right now and putting just a little money away every week. Maybe it's the money that you would have spent at Starbucks or out at a restaurant that you're not going to anymore and put it in an emergency fund. Um, you then want to make a section that says soon. And this is the area that we're not going to focus on yet, but we may focus on in the near future. And the first thing you might put on there is, well, maybe I should look at my overall spending and create some type of budget. Uh, 
take care of myself is always important. Um, determine my next career steps. Some of you may have seen your job either disappear and or you may see changes that are occurring at your workplace that may make your job somewhat obsolete or may change your job in a way that is not going to make you happy. So what do you want to do in terms of making certain that you continue to see an income? And then you want to look for opportunities to save, again, for your emergency savings, um, and then perhaps for other large purchases that you might want to consider. Uh, and then covering any other significant risks are important. And that's when we start looking at other areas of your life where there are, there's exposure and we want to cover that. The last area on your three section list is the things that we can postpone to later. And that is, you know, determining what your financial goals are. You might have thought before going into this that you were saving to purchase a house or you were saving for some other big type of purchase or change in your life. Maybe you want to just stop and say, you know what, I'm not going to think about that right now. Uh, when all of this somewhat gets a little bit more certain and the dust clears, maybe at that point in time, I want to address it. So I'm going to put that off to the side. Uh, you want to potentially at that point in time, take a look at your overall investments and see how were they set up in the past and whether there's an opportunity to develop a new type of strategy. If you don't have any estate planning documents or if you are, have estate planning documents which are old, maybe they were constructed in, a, in another state, um, it would be time to potentially dust those off and prepare them as well. And so those uh, different areas um, hopefully will help you organize what I need to work on now and what I need to look at in the future. And it's intended to give you some peace of mind and to settle you down and reduce this feeling of being overwhelmed. Another thought that you might want to do, another exercise that I'll do with people when I have them in this situation is I'll look at their overall financial situation. And so this is a, perhaps a retiree who has saved a million dollars and she's very concerned about what she's going to do and what's going to happen in the financial markets. And I'll try to calm her down and, and make certain that she understands, look, we have $100,000, 10% of your money is in complete cash. It's in the pile of money where we know where we're going to get it if we need it. And it's also intended for emergencies. Another good chunk of the money is in those safe and secure areas where if you need more money, we can access that. And it, we won't have to be accessing that if the market is down. And then we have, because most folks that they're, they're in their even 60s or 70s, where they'll say, oh, but I need money now, and they think their time horizon has shrunk to now, those women also have a long horizon too because they may leave, live for another 30 years or, or so, and so they need to have money that's going to grow for the future. Again, we look at it in terms of buckets, and so this is when I'm planning for a client that I work with um, I try to make sure that they understand that they have a bucket of cash, that they have another bucket of money that is in secure types of investments that haven't gone down, that will not go down in the market because they're very, very different than other things. And at some point we can talk about what kind of bonds they are because not all bonds are as secure. Uh, there are different types of investments that are more secure. And then we have that other, the third bucket for the longevity, for the fact that we're going to be around for a longer period of time. So again, you know, the idea of first focusing on what is really important, dividing up, making a list of, and putting it on paper so that you can get it out of your head and make sure that you're not ruminating it over it all the time and prioritizing it is very, very important. So, Order organizing your next 
financial steps. And then making sure that you have a comfort level, that you have these buckets, that you've done the money envelopes. If you don't have these buckets at this point in time, what I'd like to see you do is to start planning to create these buckets and making sure that those cash reserves are there for you, where you have cash reserves for your actual needs of what you think you're going to need over the next six to eight months, but also that cover emergencies. So when something happens, it's your plan B. When your car breaks down or your washing machine goes or, or you lose your job, that you have emergency savings, that you don't go to your credit card because credit cards are a big problem. In an, another conversation, we can talk about debt and how to get out of debt and as quick as possible and why it's such a problem. Uh, but right now, I just want to make sure that you have a place that you can go to where you're not accessing those credit cards. The other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about are some of the things that have come out of our government that are supposedly uh, there to help us through this overall uh, problem. Um, one is the stimulus. And um, I, I want to tell you that if you have are single and you make less than $75,000, that you will see $1,200 directly deposited to your account, hopefully soon. Now, I've been told that on April 17th, the, um, there will be a website that will be available to give you the status of that information. I don't know if that's been updated, but the, the stimulus items are supposed to be coming to us soon. If you're married filing jointly, if you are making less than $150,000, you'll see $2,400 come to you in a direct deposit. So you want to, um, of course, take advantage of that. That's instant money. And if you don't need it, that goes into your emergency savings, right? So the first thing I want to kind of plants a seed in your head about you're not going to take that money and buy yourself a new bicycle or something else, that you're gonna take that money and put it in your emergency savings. Now is a good time to build up those coffers. The second thing I wanted to mention is the unemployment. Now the federal, the federal government has put on an incremental unemployment benefit to a lot of people uh, beyond what the state offers. And it's $600 in addition to what the state would offer. And it's being offered to people that have been in their job for even shorter periods of time. So you may want to look at whether there's opportunities for you to get unemployment insurance. Tax filing, a lot of people know, is not going to um, be required. And on April 15th, we have an extended period of time. July 15th is our tax filing due date. So that's when uh, we're going to file. Student loans, if you have student loans, you are not required to pay those student loans back until September, which is wonderful. And they've frozen the interest rate accruement period. So you're not going to be penalized for having done that. However, this is where I'm going to give you um, the other side of the story, the con. The truth is, is that you're not going to be forgiven those student loans. You're eventually going to have to pay them. And if you have the capability of paying those student loans down, in other words, you are able to live nicely, you have your emergency savings already built up, um, I would recommend that you continue to pay those student loans down. Keep the discipline because it's, they're not going to go away. And the sooner you pay them down, the better off you'll be. Around retirement, there are a couple of things that are available to us. One is that we can take money out even if you are not 59 and a half. A lot of you know that if you put money into a qualified retirement program, that you were, if you take it out, that you're not only going to have to pay taxes, but traditionally you have to also pay a 10% penalty. Well, they've waived that 10% penalty. So we can have access to this money and we can not only can have access to this money this year, 
um, where it will be a taxable event, but we can stretch that taxable event over the next three years, which could be, be very beneficial for individuals that are in low tax income brackets. However, again, if you don't need this money, we highly recommend that you don't take it because this is your retirement. And so we really don't want to decimate our retirement. It's the same thing with 401k loans, where we were only able in the past to take up to $50,000 of our um, 401k. They have now increased the, the uh, maximum amount to $100,000. So, or 100%, $100,000. So you can get access to your 401k as a loan. The only problem is that, again, you're going after your retirement, number one. And number two, this loan could turn out to be income if something happens to your job. So you want to be careful with that. And these are the types of nuances that I want to explain might be the right answer for one person, but they're not the right answer for someone else. And this is the type of thing that we can help you with. If you have a question and you wanna call us on our helpline, we would be happy, happy to help you walk through your personal situation and whether this is right for you. The last um, thing that I wanted to say about retirement is the uh, issue around RMDs, required minimum distribution. If you are, 72 and or older and or if you have an inherited IRA where you're required to take distributions every year, the uh, government has given us a holiday from that. We don't have to take these uh, minimum distributions this year and perhaps you don't want to because um, it will be an ex another taxable event and it might require you to actually go into some investments where they are not as robust as they were before and lock in those losses. And so again, you may choose not to do that. So again, we want to be aware of our options that are available to us. Now, just to talk about the four stages, because I don't want to leave this all completely um, stopping at the ending stage. I do want to mention that uh, once we get through this ending stage, that's when we start going through the passage stage where we start defining what our future looks like. And this is where we start getting, in, getting into um, the additional financial steps, which we'll be reviewing next month in our monthly financial webinars. Um, so you'll want to get into investment planning and estate planning and taxes and other things. At this point, you may want to start thinking about whether you're going to purchase a house or make a car purchase or other large um, decisions like that. And you may even want to get into some pre and post planning. And then lastly, uh, once all the dust settles there and we get, go into our new normal and life seems to be uh, working a little bit more smoothly for us, it's at this time that we can start looking at our values and our goals and what we want our life to look like in the future and how we can use money to help our, our lives evolve and help our footprint on the world um, become more than we initially had thought. So it's at that point where we'll start feeling a little bit more confident. And it's at that point where we'll start actually getting uh, better prepared for the next potential transitions because transitions happen all the time. Hopefully they won't happen this globally for everybody, but they do happen all the time and we need to be aware of that and we need to plan for that. So when we look at all four of these items, putting things together, taking care of me, taking care of business and taking care of more, the one thing that I wanna point out to you as we're going through these stages is the arrow at the bottom pointing to feeling financially secure. We want to make sure that regardless of where we are in this transition, that you are feeling more secure, 
that you are controlling what's within your ability to control because there's certain things that we can't control and we have to just leave, um, leave there and just hope that they work well for us. There are other things that we can control. And so those are the things that we want to focus on. You know, there's really, when we look at financial planning and we look at preparing our money to work for our lives, we need to look at both sides of money. There are two sides. And so, you know, there's a technical side. And this is the side that, of course, I've been trained on, you know, with, you know, my MBA and my PhD and all, you know, it's been all focused on financial choices and financial decision making and what a rational individual should assume. However, I also have a background in psychology. And I'm very much aware that there's this other side. And so not all choices are going to be just driven by that technical side. We are not necessarily trying to build up our, our emergency savings and invest and think about good financial choices because we want to uh, develop a pile of money. That's not what is driving us. We're building up our financial security because we want to live better lives, because we want to use our money to help others and to do other things. And so it's very important that we understand that. And so there are numerous exercises that we need to go through in terms of building up our understanding of where we are in terms of our values and in terms of our goals. But it is this personal side which drives a lot of our choices and a lot of our decisions. And we need to be aware of that. When I look at uh, financial planning, I think first about a general decision-making process. And this is how we all generally make decisions. We do this, what I call gap analysis, where we understand where am I today and where do I want to get to? What do I want this uh, outcome to be? And then I try to establish the criteria on how to select my choices and come up with a decision and move forward. It's the same as if you're planning a trip. Where am I today and where do I want to go? Do I want to take drive the car? Do I want to take a train? Do I want to take an airplane? How am I going to get there? And then there's the financial planning process, which is exactly the same thing. Where am I today? Being able to assess with your financial statements, your overall spending, where your, your overall investments are, your assets, and then where do I want to go? And how do I want to make those choices and those decisions? What are my various uh, options? And it's always good to understand several options. I like to explore with my clients several options, the pros and cons of those options, and help them make the choice. Because ultimately, in order to feel empowered, you need to understand so that you're bought into the choice and that you're, you want to make that happen. But take a notice on the bottom of all of these different processes is a monitoring and modifying type of activity that occurs. Because we know that as soon as we make a financial decision, a financial plan, that is not the end of this. And in theory, this should almost be circular because at the end of the process is a go back to the beginning and make sure that I understand my current circumstances. What has changed? What is different? What new products? What new strategies? What new processes are out there that that evolve over time. And so this is an, um, an ever-changing process uh, that we recommend people do at least once a year. And when things happen in your life, perhaps uh, more often, especially when you're going through transition. So um, I want to just make a mention that I love this cartoon, this metaphor of how I see a lot of people when they come into my office and I talk to them about their current circumstances. Oftentimes they're focused on all these other things that potentially could happen that are way out there. They want to talk about the sexy things like investments and so forth, yet they don't even have an emergency savings. They don't even have the basic 
debt paid off, their basic understanding of their spending. They don't have those, those elements taken care of. And so, uh, you know, again, we need to get back to the basics and first make sure that's all covered before we extend into those other more interesting types of areas. When I talk to women, I, again, want to focus on some of the areas that are specifically important for women. The fact that the majority of recipients of long-term care benefits are women, almost 90% of the recipients are women, that the majority of uh, individuals living um, in their later years are women. And again, that um, there's a large amount of women who have not planned properly, especially during that period of transition where they became a widow or divorced, where they got themselves into trouble and they're living near poverty. And that concerns me deeply. You know, it's again about this whole transition of going through these four stages of transition gracefully, making sure that we make the right choices one step at a time. It's not like we, we clean it up all at once. We take one step at a time. And so the pitfalls that I often talk to women about when they're going through transition in general is, first of all, there is no emergency. There is no house on fire. Anybody that tries to push you into a decision or a choice um, without you fully understanding it is a problem. So you don't want to rush into any decisions right now. You want to take it slow. You're very much aware that you are in this overwhelmed stage and perhaps your neocortex part of your brain is not operating at full tilt. So take, be kind to yourself and take it slow. Um, be aware of financial predators. They're out there. Unfortunately, being part of the financial industry has been um, a very frustrating thing for me because I see a large, large range of people who are not even educated in the world of finance, giving financial information out to people to, you know, a point where people are highly educated and have the skills and have the ability to provide to women and or to anybody. And they're all call themselves financial advisors, financial planners. And so how do you discern? And maybe we'll do a whole um, talk on how you can tell who are the type of people that you should trust. Be aware, though, and ask a lot of questions when you are potentially looking to make a financial decision that involves somebody that could take advantage of you. Um, again, you know, these decisions around what am I going to do in terms of my housing or any other large purchases or other types of things that could be irrevocable, take a breath, take a step back, and perhaps... Um, these big decisions shouldn't be made at these time, this time. Facing reality really has to do with really understanding your financial situation. There are a lot of people that are in denial. They do not understand. And it's on both sides. I have some women that, who are really not in a good situation and they refuse to understand that. And they continue to spend as if they, everything is just fine. And it's not. I have other women that I work with who are in a very comfortable situation and they're so afraid that they're going to be a bag lady, which is oftentimes something that I hear from women, that, they, um, that they're not willing to spend the money that, that would make their lives better. And so we want to get a true financial awareness established. So we want to get that reality um, and we don't want to be a purse. And this is for, we don't want to be a purse for our families. We don't want to be a purse for potentially suitors. Um, we have seen so many situations where unfortunately, if women do have some savings or some financial security, that they're approached by people that they think care about them and love them. And they perhaps do, but they don't understand the damage that they could do to them. So being very, very careful about um, sharing our finances before we understand whether we're okay or not is really important. 
And just in general, ABCs, um, we definitely want to, first of all, ask questions, ask lots of questions. When I've uh, had some of my best clients have followed me around for even a year. I think of my one, um, my favorite client, Diane, um, who might actually be watching this at some point. Uh, she followed me around. I was doing webinars and seminars and different. She followed me around for a year and she asked me a whole bunch of questions before she actually decided that she wanted to work with me. And that is, was the best scenario because she felt confident and secure in her ability to make a choice. Uh, you also should, whether you're making a choice around a product, an individual, or a decision, continue to ask questions. Don't ever be afraid to ask questions. Don't sign anything until you understand it. And I don't care if you have to make somebody wait and reiterate and answer and answer and answer. You just continue to ask. The second thing is very much related, buyer beware. Um, make sure you understand what you're buying. So again, signing those contracts, they're legal. Don't sign it if you don't understand it. And C is um, about uh, caring for yourself, making sure that you take care of yourself. And so, um, you know, again, what to do now, it's about self-awareness. We want to make sure that we normalize things, that we understand where we are. I want you to understand that if you're feeling overwhelmed, you are not alone. The rest of the world is overwhelmed, and um, you should just be aware of that. We should name it. Once we name it, if we name it, our fears and our anxieties and actually put it down on paper, which is a whole nother exercise that I like to do with um, women when they're going through these types of stresses, is actually identifying what our greatest fears are on paper, writing it down, identifying how much of it we can control and how much it will, you know, what is the worst case scenario is often good because it can give us clarity around what really is happening. We want to organize ourselves, make sure that we understand these are the things I can control. These are the things I can't control. The things I can't control, we're going to move off to the side right now. And ultimately to prioritize what are the most important things that we want to focus on? Really, really key. So I'm actually uh, going to quickly go past this slide. Um, I just wanted to to talk about how get, getting a sense of your financial situation can really make a difference in your life. I've worked with women at Spark, the Rape Crisis Center, where they, even though they had money and had the wherewithal and actually earned money, that they didn't feel like they could take control of it. And it actually impacted how they were treated, both physically and in terms of what they heard about themselves. There are other women who are not as in dire straits, but um, don't feel that they can make decisions. And oftentimes the choices that are made are not in their best interest. And then there are women who are um, actually starting to gain control and are going out there. And I think of in, um, for example, Sarasota, all the giving circles that are out there where women they may not completely understand everything about money, but they're able to actually donate money to their favorite not-for-profits and how, how great that feels to be able to make a difference in the world. Uh, I have a, a quick little video that I'd love to share with you. Um, I'm going to take my sound off so you can hear it better. There are no mistakes. There really are no mistakes. We all know that. We get all flustered. We get stressed all the time. I need something to be what it is. There is a supreme moment of destiny calling on your life. Your job is to feel that, to hear that, to know that. And sometimes when you're not listening, you get taken off track. You get in the wrong marriage, the wrong relationship, you take the wrong job. Yeah, but it's all leading to the same path. There are no wrong paths. There are none. There's no such thing as failure, really. Because failure is just 
that thing trying to move you in another direction. So you get as much from your losses as you do from your victories. Because the losses are there to wake you up. When you understand that, you don't allow yourself to be completely thrown by a grade or by a circumstance because your life is bigger than any one experience. What would you say to your younger self? Every person says, in one thing, I'm going to say, relax. Relax. It's going to be okay. It really is going to be okay. Because even if you're on a detour right now, and, and that's how you know when you're not at ease with yourself. That is the cue that you need to be moving in another direction. Don't let yourself get all thrown off, continue to be thrown off course. When you're feeling off course, that's the key. How do I turn around? So when everybody was talking about, when I started this network, if I had only known, good Lord, how difficult it would be. Um, the way through the challenge is to get still and ask yourself, what is the next right move? Not think about, oh, I got all of this. To me. What is the next right move? And then from that space, make the next right move and the next right move. And not to be overwhelmed by it because you know your life is bigger than that. You know you're not defined by what somebody says is a failure for you because failure is just there to point you in a different direction. Okay. okay sorry, sorry, I have this microphone issue. Uh, I, so the next right move. The next right move. That's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on the idea that, you know what, we're going to, whatever we did in the past, wherever we were in the past, whatever issues occurred in the past, we have today and we have tomorrow, and we're going to start taking the next right move. So what I want to encourage everybody that's listening to this, this video or this webinar is to please don't beat up on yourself. Don't feel bad about what you've done financial, in terms of your financial choices or your decisions. We can get you to a point where you start feeling like you can protect yourself from financial disaster, where you can start making decisions that are on your terms and living your life affect your community and your workplace and impact the world. And so um, I, I just want to encourage all of you that that no matter where you are, we can do this because you can choose to live in the front row or the third row. And my recommendation is those ladies in the first row look much more um, like they're having a good time than those women in the third row. <laughs> so Lori, um, are you uh, monitoring? Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, I love that, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to remind everyone, if you would like to ask a question, on the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon, those bubbles, um, that says Q&A. Just click there and then you can type your question. But I do have two questions that came in. And one is, can you please tell us a little bit about the helpline that you talked about? Absolutely. So we wanted to create a, an opportunity that women could contact somebody that has a financial expertise. Uh, generally, right now, it's just me. <laughs> um, but in, in the future, there are several people that have already expressed interest in being a volunteer on this helpline. Uh, the requirement to be on the helpline is we must, they must have a CFP designation, which is a designation that requires um, an individual to have at least a minimum base level of financial knowledge and understand the financial planning process. Uh, you can call in and let us know, you know what your question is. We're going to ask you a bunch of questions because, of course, uh, the nuance of your life will matter in terms of how we want to answer the question. There's really, and we can help you understand the pros and cons of your choices. 
Um, so we're hoping that we can help give you some guidance and be a place where you can get a second opinion or um, get an idea that is unbiased, objective, no agenda, not trying to sell you anything, not trying to get you to be part of um, anything else. Okay, and I think we have time for one more. Okay. Uh, what are the financial experts predicting for how long it will take to get the economy moving? Oh, yikes. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I do um, spend a lot of time. Um, I have friends who are economists. I mean, I actually, my PhD is in finance and economics. And, you know, so I, I mean, I'm looking at the data also, and I can tell you there are, there are things that are, that are somewhat positive in place. And then there are other things that are quite concerning. And uh, I, I really hesitate to say uh, anything because, uh, you know, there are two kinds of economists, those that don't know and those that don't know they don't know. I mean, there, we, we all know that, that, that we're doing crystal ball types of work when we, write, when we forecast. Um, but, but there's been enough damage to our economy that it's going to take a little time to get back. How quickly? Um, it, it, it does depend, uh, I think, a lot on the healthcare issues, on you know, how quickly we get um, you know, medication to actually help those that are sick and finally a vaccine that makes us feel more confident to go out and live our lives. I wish I had a better answer, but <laughs> not. But that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Laura. And thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Have a great, great month. You too. Thanks.